fun and games indeed, but not necessarily just games and not necessarily just board games. In fact, I am going to talk in here to the ones who we shall hence from be known as the Valdowskis, uh, from All Rolled Up, um, who, I mean, All Rolled Up is an absolutely fantastic concept that I have enjoyed literally for years since I first got my two Rolled Ups that I have been using relentlessly since, and they still hold up. Amazingly enough, they still hold up. Firstly, I want to know who had the idea for All Rolled Up? That's, no, that is a debate because he says it was his idea and I said it was my idea. Yeah, well, <laughs> so I, I've, I've been a gamer for 30 years okay. and I, as a GM, wanted something. I always like to have things that are compact and bring everything I need. So uh, I wanted to have a dice bag which could hold my pens and my cards and everything. And I think I'd mentioned it a few times to Phil. Mm -hmm. And we had like a brainstorming moment where we basically just sketched out lots of ideas. Mm -hmm. I think so it started off that I said I was going to go, I usually sell jewelry, which we have some of these for sale, but um, I make jewelry and that's what I used to do at game shows rather than dice bags. And I said, oh, let's make some drawstring dice bags. And then he said, well, how about we do something different? And that's where it sort of took off from there. Now, how did the idea come for the materials? Because the one thing about the old rolled ups is that they are indestructible. I mean, I hope so. <laughs> how do you go about choosing what fabrics to use and to put them together? Right. I, I use nothing but really top quality fabrics. I, 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 that's why what you pay is what you get for the price of the fabric. Um, our ranges start from about 20 pounds up to 40 pounds, but basically you're paying for the fabric itself in the value of the amount of money rather than the, the construction. The, each all rolled up is constructed all the same. And I, I make a product that is, you know, I sew it up where it's really good quality. I want it to last a lifetime. I know that's not a good business model, but saying that, I want it to last. I, I've been doing this now for over four years and I've never seen one come apart yet. So if anybody's out there that has one apart, send it back to me, I will replace it free of charge. I mean, or repair it if I have to. So that's where I stand behind my product. I mean. You know, everything is very top quality fabric. I use 100% cottons mainly. We do have oil skin fabric, which is comes from the same factory as they make barber coats. Mm -hmm. So those really nice expensive coats, that's the same oil skin I use. I have a, a little guy in the um, uh, Hebrides who makes, who makes Harris tweeds for me. <laughs> So, um, well, he makes Harris Tweed. He's been doing it for 60 years. And um, I approached a lot of companies for Harris Tweed and nobody would sell me anything because they are supplying companies like Harrods and whatnot. And this guy here, I, I think because his mother had died, he decided he wasn't going to do it anymore. And then he started making a little bit. And then we've been talking and now he's actually, he designed a tweed for me, um, with little rainbow spec. So it's my rainbow um, Harris tweed. But like I said, you know, just, I, I try to find companies here in the UK or Europe, because I, I, I believe in keeping everything made here and that's where you're going to get a good quality product none of this is constructed in china everything that we construct is constructed in the uk and it's our family run business but also you are incredibly prolific in the type of designs and the amount of designs that you actually dish out because i i follow you quite closely and it's all the time that you have oh look at this Star Wars theme, look at this new dragon theme, look at this new everything themed. How do you find those fabrics? Well, you it's have a lot, a lot of shopping. Yeah, <laughs> we have a lot of, um, I, ha I have a lot of companies I deal with um, at wholesale and they show me their new product lines that they bring out and then I just basically look at the design and think, hmm, 
will that be something a gamer would like or if it's something sometimes the problem with the fabric industry is that you have to order six to eight months in advance you get your fabric and then you'll never get it again so you've kind of got to buy when you can and you've got to think about what your collectors like and I've gone to enough conventions to see what sort of games people like and I have so many good designs because there are so many things that people like and everybody likes everybody's different and everybody wants something different so it would be really boring if I had to sew a hundred two hundred three hundred of the same color whereas you could have something you know that I might make 20 or 30 of and then that'll be it it'll be an exclusive to that amount so have you actually considered and I think I know what the answer is gonna be but have you actually considered producing something cheaper and mass produced and just sell to absolutely everyone we, did that. we, we have tried that so we experimented with that um, basically we worked um, with one of, one of the game companies um, to try and find a way to produce all rolled up as a mass produced product for, for a Kickstarter um, and we we went to a uh, there was a, a place in Turkey um, and you mentioned how solid your 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 game rolls are. Um, I think that made it hard, too hard for them to produce it. So they they effectively created some products. They we sent them one so they could reverse engineer it. They could look exactly how it had been put together. Um, and what we got back was like a, a a shadow of the 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 product that you receive that's handmade. Um, it was clear that the actual process that Phil goes through in making them by hand is just too much for mass production without without forcing the price point way way up and that's the point of mass production is to is to reduce the price uh, and it just wasn't possible you know I'm, I'm going to confess something and I understand those people who couldn't make it because I have a friend who decided to make one for his son's uh, first communion as a, as a present and she reverse engineered one of my one rolled up, uh, rolled up. She broke three needles in her sewing machine, trying to actually put the whole thing together, yeah. and she gave up. She bought him the, the little boy something else instead because it was so hard. It is. It is. I mean, saying that, I, I did email back to the company with uh, a two-page email of everything that was wrong with that all rolled up and what needed to be corrected and they threw it back in my face and said find somebody else to do your product so really uh, that's why whenever you buy an all rolled up it is you know you're getting a really good quality product so um, but yeah I know I've seen a few people copy my product out there in the beginning I was really protective and jealous and and I, I have to admit I was really upset to see that but now I know that I have an established tra a brand and everybody knows what an all rolled up is. And if people are copying me, it's kind of, okay, you know, it, it's not a compliment, but, uh, but at the same time, it's... It is a compliment in a way. They've, they've seen something that, 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 that yeah, exactly. But it's really, really hard <laughs> to, to, make, to make one yourself. Um, yeah. Well, Good, because that's a luxury product that should continue and remain like that, really. That's that's what's so cool about it. Yeah. And so it's unique. Every design is unique. Well, I'm hoping now that um, we've just got a, um, a studio that I've gotten with doing a bit more work to it, and I'm going to get some machines after Essen. So please come to Essen, buy lots of stuff for me so I can buy some <laughs> machines. Um, and then I want to possibly early next year um, start training some people to start helping me sew parts of the product. But we really want to keep this made in the UK because I think a lot of people buy it because it's, it's, it is made in the UK. It's like if you were to go to um, you know different other companies that have UK brands, you no, know, someone will buy it because it is a UK made product. So uh, you know, I think I believe that now. I, you know, China's getting so expensive to buy anything from prices of fabric because obviously a lot of the fabrics, even their American companies that might buy them, a lot of the fabrics do come from China or they're made in the the East. 
and obviously the prices of cotton have gone up because of the it's all based on the American dollar and, and pound and conversion rates. So I've seen fabrics actually hiked up really, really bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, even with my felt dice trays, because we do dice trays as well, um, the, uh, that's all based on the wool felt and prices are based on commodities in Australia for merino wool felt. So it's all kind of a, you know, a mixed bag there. But um, yeah, I just like I said, it's just we think that we, we could do this in the UK, you know. Let's bring some manufacturing back to the EU. Well, EU for now. <laughs> and then uh, hopefully, uh, you know, I still am hoping there's going to be a last minute retrieval that will stay with the EU because I really, I won't even go in there. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the best thing that's come out of that has been I've got more American customers. Right. But the worst thing is the prices of everything. Everything that I make, um, every part of that has gone up. Um, the, the, the raw product has gone up because we've left the EU. We're leaving the EU. Right, you say everything you make. Show me more things because I know that you use some really cool stuff. Well, I didn't bring the felt dice trays. It started with my felt dice tra uh, trays because I found the felt at a fabric show and I thought, I can't make an aru out of that because it'll stretch. It's it's uh, wool felt. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, I had that piece of felt sample for ages. And then I, I have to thank Tom Pleasant out there for this because he was bugging me for a year to make a dice tray that would go into an all rolled up. And he had something that somebody had made, but it was really big and bulky and it wasn't anything portable. And, you know, I have to admit, I had a, I, I have a tray at home. It's a hard one for putting keys and things in. And I thought, mm, maybe if I use that engineering and do a dice tray that folds over, mm -hmm. but it'll fit into our all rolled up. Because I've now been told by Paul that pretty much everything we make has to fit into an all rolled up. Yeah. So, so basically, I have to tell her off whenever she does something that won't fit. Yeah, I get a little, I get a little creative, but basically we have these. Um, um, so, and then we were making the felt ones for about a year, and I got so many people asking me about printing on the felt, and I said I can put little badges on, but I can't print on the felt. And then I saw um, Paul from Patriot Games. He makes play mats. Um, I was at the furnace event, and I said, oh. You know, my brain just ticked and I said, oh, I wonder if I can cut these and put the snaps on and make a dice tray and voila, the neoprene dice tray was born and we can print on these, we can print whatever design you want. So, so um, this one is um, from the Simbrum role playing game. Uh -huh. uh, so we've got a license with the Sim uh, Jarnringen, uh, which is a Swedish um, game developer. Um, and they do some lovely images. So, and we worked with uh, the artist Ralph Horsley um, uh, and got some lovely dragon images from him. Uh, Bill Babble, who is a, uh, a local artist to us in England, um, he does uh, Inked Adventures, does uh, dungeon tiles. Mm -hmm. So we've got lots of dungeon designs. And, and you bought this lovely piece of artwork. Oh, yes. I don't know the guy's name, but this is basically our exclusive artwork to use for a Cthulhu one of your arm. So, um, and what's the name of this guy? Do you remember? No, he's not. No. He's not but, but, oh, it's, his name's in here. Oh, okay. Uh, it is uh, Henning Ludwigsen. And this is his original art, but we we have exclusive rights for this now. So this is, we decided, we, we, we felt we had to buy our own artwork and have a really cool Cthulhu one. So so basically they're ergonomic. Um, they snap up as Paul has done to portable. So you can use them not just for role playing, but board games. You can put them inside the board game box. Um, skirmish games like Warhammer, um, any Guild Ball, any of those games. Because the compact we have in two sizes, so you've got a big one if you prefer a bigger dice tray or we've got the compact ones which are designed to go with the skirmish games um, and they they rubber on the back so they don't slip um, they're ergonomic how you can unfold and unfold them fully washable so if you're drinking coke coffee you spill it you just rinse it under a tap and and just hang it up and it's done it won't stain or anything I've tested all this out <laughs> So, and best of all, it folds down flat, weighs 50 grams, and it'll fit inside your all rolled up. So you roll it up in that. So. Well, that's not perfect, that's an, uh, not, nothing else. And show me the map again, please. Right. This 
Can I see the map? <laughs> Brand new. This is an exclusive to Essen. We've just started this. Um, basically, um, Paul from Patriot Games, again, he's my one of my business partners. We've started a new company as well. I'll tell you in a moment about that. But basically, this is um, maps that we print on velvet. Mm -hmm. So you've got a bit of bling at the table um, when you're playing your role-playing games. So that can lay on the table and the GM can be, be talking about you know, parts in the game and you can point to bits on the map mm -hmm. and that again, because keeping into the rules it has to fit into my all rolled up, that will fold up really nicely, nice and small and it'll just fit into the pocket of an all rolled up. But it's beautiful. I mean, you won't be, you, you can't see it, but uh, you just it's, feel that. And I, I have been touching this for a while now and I tell you, it feels amazing. It's, it's so, it is. so I mean, smooth. It. But it is velvet, printed velvet. This is brand new. Um, it's a, a product that we're going to be releasing um, in the store probably when we get back. And we also do the Zach Smith's Maze of the Blue Medusa, which I don't have with me, but um, it's back at the table. But that is an awesome piece of artwork. And actually, Ken from Satire Games, I've got a picture of him. Um, he's actually got his map at his game, and he can just show where bits are in the dungeon. So, yeah. Now, I've seen already the art of Cthulhu, but talk to me about Cthulhu hack, because you've been at it for a bit now, um, <laughs> and I want yeah. to know more about it, because it looks and it sounds rather excellent. So, what's Cthulhu hack? So, um, as I said, I've been a gamer for 30 years, um, and I know there are a lot of games out there, a lot of very thick games, mm -hmm. yeah? Um, and I'm always excited about new games, but sometimes they're tough to get into because there's a lot to get through. Um, so the idea, um, last year a, a, ga a game designer called David Black came up with a, uh, a system called the Black Hack, mm -hmm. which was a, a very simple way of running dungeon type adventures, so taking the style of Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder, but making a system that you could effectively just sit down, create characters really quickly, and enjoy the game, rather than having to worry about all the rules. Um, and that was a really neat system, and he had it as an open license. And now I've played, I was speaking to somebody earlier, I've played Call of Cthulhu since 1990, 1985, I think. I got second edition Call of Cthulhu. Um, and I loved, so I love the game, but there's a lot of rules. Seventh edition, seventh edition, I like to point out to people, seventh edition's chase chapter, mm -hmm. just about chases, is longer than this entire book. So this is just for those times when you want to play a Lovecraft-based horror game with a simple system, characters you can create in five minutes, mm -hmm. without having to worry about, uh, long character generation is great, but this means you don't have to worry about it. You can just get on with playing the game. Mm -hmm. And it means that I can sit down. When I was at Gen Con, I ran games of this in, an, uh, in basically a two hour slot. Okay. So, and they created characters. They, they went through the adventure in two hours. Um, and when you think about it, we live in a day and age now that we lead very busy lives. And pretty much conventions are where we can sit down and do long role playing games. But a lot of people are finding they're not having a lot of time in other than conventions to actually sit down with a group. Like we have a group that we meet up with once a week. And, um, you know, we've got, f what, three hours or four hours yeah, to play. Three hours normally, yeah. Three, and three hours isn't a lot of time if you're having to worry about creating, you know, c creating and even maintaining characters. So, so again, a, a lot, there are a lot of systems that do long games well, mm -hmm. but if you just want to sit down and play short games, one or two weeks or something, um, and this is simple enough that you can take adventures from other Cthulhu-based systems, because other, others are available, obviously, yeah. um, and you can convert them on the fly. So, How does it work? So, um, you have, it has two basic mechanics. One, one is called saves, so if you're threatened by something, um, you have six scores, which look very familiar, because they're like strength, dexterity, constitution, um, but if you're threatened by something that's gonna hurt you, you roll a 20-sided die, and you need to roll lower than your score but the GM tells you beforehand what's going to happen if you fail. So it's very clear what happens in that case. Um, the other thing that it has is what are called resource dice. So the, the game allows you to measure resources like your ability to investigate or your sanity on a die. 
So, for example, you could have a eight-sided die which shows how much sanity you've got and a 10-sided die that shows how good you are at visual investigation so that if you go into a room and there's a horrible, there's a sacrifice going on, you would roll your sanity die. Um, and if you roll a one or two, your dice drops down from whatever level it is to the next smaller one. Mm -hmm. So as the adventure goes on, every time you roll a one or two on any of these dice, it gets smaller and smaller. And the idea is to simulate the feel of Lovecraft's stories where the, the, the I'll call them heroes, but the people at the center of the story become more and more involved with the horror and they realize that they are in increasing amounts of trouble because their ability to handle the horror is getting less and less as time goes on. Most of them obviously go insane in the end or they get killed off. And that's really what I'm trying to do here is, is, is show the players as they're playing that the threat is getting greater and greater because their resources are getting smaller and smaller as the game goes on. If I have an awful lot of material for Call of Cthulhu or Trail of Cthulhu, how easy would it be to convert it to the Cthulhu hack? So those, those would be two good examples in that Call of Cthulhu breaks all its skills down. Mm -hmm. um, in the older versions, they were almost like categories. So you would have academic skills, communication skills, and you would have physical skills, mm -hmm. which would cover your fighting. In this, you have uh, your academic skills are covered by flashlights. Mm -hmm. Your communication skills are covered by smokes. Mm -hmm and your uh, physical skills are covered by your ability to attack and uh, with uh, weapons um, or without weapons. And they are all part of your resource pools. So basically, if a character in Call of Cthulhu had very strong communication skills, they would have a high smokes die, which means they're good at social interaction. On the other hand, Trailer Cthulhu does something very similar, actually, with the whole idea that you always get the clue, for example. And that's what this works on the base, same basis, that you always get the clue. And again, it divides its abilities down into similar categories. So you have academic ones uh, for your investigation and your communication ones and physical ones. So you basically just take those three categories and they become the dice in these games. So uh, basically, it should be just a matter of minutes to convert any of those adventures into something that you can play much, much quicker. Absolutely. So, I mean, an example would be the, uh, a convention, the UK Games Expo. Um, I ran two sessions of a game um, uh, based on uh, War World War Cthulhu. Uh -huh. I had just received a supplement from a Kickstarter, the Covert uh, Actions, uh, I think it was called. Uh -huh. um, and I read through one of the adventures because it looked really interesting. Um, and without any actual conversion, I ran it for two groups over a four hour slot with, with no preparation of any kind other than just reading the adventure. That sounds absolutely amazing. What's in the future for a Cthulhu hack? What, what are you going to do with it? Um, so this is version 1.5. Last, last year was the release of the original and I've, I've basically um, uh, increased the depth of it and uh, provided more uh, support in terms of examples and background ideas and more flexibility in terms of alternative rules. Mm -hmm. uh, but the next thing is a, uh, a set of three adventures called The Three Faces of the Wendigo, okay. um, written by myself, Richard August and John Almack, who both have experience in writing for uh, other game companies and also for Call of Cthulhu in John Almack's case. And um, we're each writing our own take on the Wendigo in terms of its mythology um, and providing three very different adventures and that should be out late November, early, very early December. I want to get it out and published for Christmas. By Dragon Meat and Christmas. Oh, yes, because yes, Dragon, Dragon Meat will be our next big convention in the UK. Well, he's already got it in the advert, so you better have it done. Yes, it is, it is in the advert for Dragon Meat, so I really do have to have it finished, yeah. So. Well, guys, thank you so much, very, very much indeed for being here. I absolutely adore all the products. That is looking very interesting and I need to take a look at that for many, many reasons. Best of luck at the show. I really hope Spiel will work for you very well. It's our, been our second one. We, we came for the first time last year. Though our first debut was about four years ago. We had some people bring stock over for us. But, um, yeah, it's just growing in leaps and bounds. And I can't keep up. I'm tied to my sewing machine all the time. But we are going to be expanding. We, I have sort of slowly started moving some stuff out but um, and getting more people involved, you know, 
doing it. I think we can grow. We can grow really well. So. Oh, fingers crossed. It does, and it does a lot. Best of luck, and thank you so much. Thank you very much.